So, uh, morning everybody. Um, so, we're talking here about digitalization, evolution or revolution, and what are the geoscience, what are geoscientists doing differently? Um, I work at the Oil and Gas Technology Center. Um, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about that in a minute, and, uh, and I hope that you'll be able to build, build some links and understanding with what we're trying to do and, and where we stand in, in this whole space. Okay, so uh, three themes. Uh, I want to introduce the OGTC, um, and I want to tell you a bit more about who we are and how we work, because it's to do with collaboration, it's to do with introducing technology. Um, and also, I want to give you a, a case study from the Oil and Gas Technology Centre, which, uh, which showcases um, a good example of how geoscientists are working differently, and, uh, and also as an example for, for future work and future collaboration with some learnings there. Um, and I'm going to finish by sharing a little bit on uh, what does tomorrow's energy landscape look like, um, and that, I hope, will give everybody a bit of inspiration for how geoscientists need to keep working uh, in the future differently. So the Oil and Gas Technology Centre is a, a not-for-profit, independent company. We are not owned by the government. Um, we were set up um, with uh, public funding in 2016, uh, and this was money that was made available from the UK government and the Scottish government uh, to as part of the Aberdeen City and Region deal. So we have three primary aims, um, and the first one is very, very much in, uh, in agreement with the Oil and Gas Authority, which is to unlock the full potential of the UK continental shelf. So at the heart of what we're trying to do is to support maximizing economic recovery of hydrocarbons in the UK CS. We also aim to anchor the supply chain in the northeast of Scotland for the UK industry. We already are a hub and a, an immense capability for engineering and technology and all the skills that go with that, the supply chain in, in what's a very hostile environment. Um, and we also want to inspire a culture of innovation uh, and transformation. So we work in three main ways, by driving action through technology roadmaps to achieve maximizing economic recovery in the UK and to grow that supply chain. We deliver projects that will move the dial on key challenges and opportunities across the UK continental shelf and beyond. And we aim to connect industry, governments, regulators, and academia to drive technology investment and deployment. So we're very much about partnering. We're very much about collaboration with industry, government, and academia. So this dashboard, pretty busy, but what I want to do is I want to say that I don't stand alone in the company, obviously. Uh, we were set up in 2016. Um, the Subsurface Solution Center is one of seven. Um, six of them are shown here. The seventh one is brand new, which is to do with net zero the net zero basin, and the metrics here are talking about the existing six. So our six solution centers are shown in the bar graph in the middle, and this is where we have over 200 approved projects in the oil and gas technology center. Many of them are in the first bar here, which is to do with marginal uh, developments. So we have over 300 uh, discovered and as yet undeveloped marginal discoveries in the UK continental shelf. So a focus of, of the OGTC from the beginning, from 2016, has been to, focus on, it's been to focus on marginal developments. We also have a lot of projects under asset integrity, um, aging, rusting uh, facilities which are really needing to be extended way beyond their original field life. Um, we also have a load of projects in wells, uh, delivering wells cheaper, quicker, looking at the whole well life cycle. Um, and we have uh, digital transformation, um, decommissioning, and subsurface finally. So you see subsurface at the end there has only five projects. We're actively working on maturing more projects in subsurface. So we partner with industry, as I've said, we have invested 128 million, um, around about 40% uh, of that is from OGTC funding and the rest is from in-kind partnering with industry. 
Um, just to touch on some of the other activities, we have screened over 580 different technologies in the last uh, two and a half years. We have also an accelerator program, so we've set up 20 companies through our accelerator program in, in transforming the industry. Um, we work with a membership model and we welcome membership of all sorts of organizations from operators, service companies, um, academics, and so on. So, and we also have an awful lot of visitors through our door. We are based in the center of Aberdeen, uh, a nice building that we have, and we are very much a company that welcomes people in. We hold workshops, we hold talks, etc. So I want to talk now, the second bit, about uh, giving you a case study example. We have five projects live in subsurface, and four of them I'm going to talk about now. Um, these projects are heavily involved with the National Data Repository, and we've had a great deal of involvement with the Oil and Gas Authority in setting them up. And as we continue to work through them. They're in progress right now, so I'm not going to show you a lot of fascinating results on analyzing um, missed pay, but I am going to tell you a little bit of the learnings that we've had and how we've tried to collaborate together to make something quite extraordinary happen. Um, this is a digital geoscience data project. Um, the area of interest Originally, it's the yellow area, actually, but um, we found that we've extended it a little bit out so that we're dealing with whole blocks, which makes it simpler for the, uh, the data scientists to work with all the uh, nomenclature. Um, the study encompasses over 5,700 wells plus sidetracks. Um, it has been a collaboration between the Oil and Gas Technology Center plus nine operators plus the Oil and Gas Authority and the Norwegian Petroleum Directorate. So you'll see that the area of interest, it's a very large area, sitting between the, the north uh, east coast of Scotland and Norway. Um, and also we straddle the UK-Norway uh, boundary. Um, it's a portfolio of four projects. I'll talk a little bit about them and how they're set up. And what we're aiming to do here is to develop machine learning techniques to identify overlooked pay in all of these wells. Um, we're using available well logs, stuff that's publicly available, um, associated unstructured data, core and reports, et cetera, all within this area of interest. In this phase, we are excluding seismic data. And I've got a couple of words on seismic coming up. So, um, I mentioned that we have four projects, so that's because we have four different developers working on this. We have data donations from the National Data Repository, from the um, Norwegian Petroleum Directorate, and also from the nine operators in the UK. There are more than nine operators in the UK, there are somewhat, something near 30, but nine of them uh, collaborated with this in this uh, set of projects. Um, we have two uh, companies, Energective and Dataco, who are conditioning the data, so they're preparing it to be machine readable. Um, and then Energective will continue into the data analytics piece, and they'll be joined then with Merkel Akila and Earth Science Analytics. And these three companies will all, actually, they'll all produce a, a set of, uh, a list of missed pay zones from all of these 5,700 plus wells. So it's a, it's a big uh, and quite an ambitious uh, portfolio of projects and it's in progress just now. We're actually meeting the end of the data conditioning stage and we're going to be going into the analytics stage uh, very, very soon. So the deliverables are going to be a comparison and an analysis of various machine learning techniques for data conditioning and analytics. Um, we're going to be providing a, a rank list of uh, overlooked pay opportunities in the order of confidence. And we're going to provide a clean and conditioned data set to the National Data Repository. This is a little snapshot um, from Dataco, who are one of, the one of the two developers working on conditioning this large uh, set of information. Kind of busy. 
But um, what it shows on the left-hand side, these two are graphs showing the, uh, the quantity of structured data items that we have in this area of the Northern North Sea. Um, the North just shows the relative amount per year along the bottom, go from 1964 up to 2016. So basically on the left-hand side, you can clearly see, uh, here's your cumulative curve, you can s clearly see that there's been a, an exponential growth of uh, digital well log type data, not surprising, but this shows the actual numbers here, over 200,000 data items in, in, you know, in this sort of digital well log space. Um, and you can see on the right-hand side, the unstructured data. So this refers to stuff like uh, reports, um, images, et cetera. And in this space, you can see that petrophysics has actually kind of dropped off. It's not so that we get very much less unstructured data in petrophysics. Um, drilling, in this case, re refers to uh, geological drilling reports and so on. Um, but we also have a, a growth of core, which, uh, which I think are probably these uh, core image data, which was added into the National uh, Data Archive, Data Repository uh, quite recently. So I think Regardless of all the detail that you might want to look into this, it was pretty interesting when you, when you do go over there and, and discuss it. But we found some very big issues with data standardization in, in carrying out this process. In particular, and this is just a sample, we found that uh, data columns are, are not standardized. The naming conventions are not standardized. Coordinate systems and so on. Uh, and also formation tops. That's, that's not going to come as a surprise to any geologist in the room um, because we specialize in, in calling things different things. But uh, it is an issue and it needs to be uh, addressed if we're going to get after machine learning from our, our national data. There's a, a neat little uh, report uh, published by Dataco on their website which can allow you to click on these bits and interrogate them in, in more detail. So I wanted to finish uh, a couple of slides here on how this actually has gone. Um, the timeline, I haven't mentioned that in the Oil and Gas Technology Center, we, we attract new technology into our building and into the industry in, in, a, in a few different ways. Um, one of them is just by ad hoc, um, by meeting, by connecting with people and people come and speak to us. They may have a great idea and, and, and we work together. We also have a call calls for ideas under particular themes. And actually these four projects uh, were initiated by uh, a call for ideas, which happened um, back in December, 2017. Um, we had a workshop to set the scene, what were explorationists looking for? They wanted more uh, digitalization and more digital capability in, in analyzing uh, publicly available data. Um, and when that call for ideas was launched here in December. The OGA also supported the project heavily and they, and they made a, a request out to industry. And there was a great deal of interest and uptake. But to cut a long story short, from that initial request and the willingness being expressed to actually getting the data, which happens all the way over here, uh, was, was quite a long time. Some operators are very quick to deliver and provide data and others are very much more uh, careful and much more slow. And of course, I understand it's not a number one business priority and that will always come in the way, but notwithstanding, there was a huge range of, uh, of times that it took the different operators to deliver the different data that they, they had uh, agreed to give. Um, and also on the legal agreement start, that was another long story. So around about a year. And we're talking here about data that are publicly released. They are in the public domain. So it was an awful long time to get the agreements in place, including around the projects themselves. Um, so I just want to throw that out there. I don't have an answer, but I think it really helps to show the length of time that has taken not only to get the data, <laughs> but also to agree how we're going to use it. Okay, so yeah, we found there are some historical gaps in the data. Um, data that some, some, some have got no digital well logs and that needs to be addressed through machine learning. We found the data release was complex uh, and it's definitely not standardized. And we also found that, well, if we were to streamline some legal agreements, this would really ena enable uh, collaboration in a big way. Easy for me to say that I am not a legal person. So I think I've kind of covered most of this, but I think if I focus a little bit um, on, on, on the major learnings, 
it's really to say that the national data repositories should be a home for gold standard data to be a true national resource. Non-standardized well and formation naming conventions and formatting and coordinate, coordinates are a problem. Um, and we've got a legacy of non-machine readable formats. Um, so if we really want to get after digitalization and using our, our digital data fully, these are some key things that we, that we, you know, we need to acknowledge and uh, put some resources into addressing. The opportunities here are that we can create an ecosystem for the wider use, uh, usage and viewing of, of this public data. Um, we can also, of course, look to using cloud storage. We're already doing this, but cloud storage and computing technology to handle and facilitate rapid access and interrogation of the data. Um, we've got a, a fantastic opportunity to build large regional scale training models for machine learning. Um, UK is not alone in North Sea, obviously we've Norway, we've all the other countries that are, are close together. We've got a, this huge legacy data set and, 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 and experience in the North Sea already, and of course, in other areas of the world. So um, this is a big opportunity. And also on the seismic, I said I'd mention it, and this is my mention, um, to have raw seismic data that are publicly accessible from released data sets is really, really going to be essential. And um, we've got a project in hand just now to look at how we can help to automate this, how we can help to make it better, but there really is going to need to be quite a big effort on the part of, of operators to make this, this raw data available um, and in, into, the, into the released domain so that people can, other companies can get using it. So a look ahead. So some bubbles here. Um, this uh, slide, it's quite simple uh, in some ways, and in other ways, you can dig into the numbers, but I'd perhaps urge us not to do that too much. But um, these numbers are these, these bubbles charts were compiled by my colleague uh, Martin Tullock, who is the new Solution Center Manager for Net Zero. So Martin has taken the Committee for Climate Change uh, report from 2019, which sets out a vision for how offshore energy is going to be provided in the UK. And it shows from 2020, where we have around about £24 billion pounds worth of value from uh, oil and gas production, um, we, we move through from 2020, 30, 40 and 50, we see that the contribution uh, of value from oil and gas, it's still going to be very much there in 2050, but it's going to be a little bit less than half. The actual numbers, as I say, are based on today's oil and gas prices. So the number is perhaps, is more, is more to do, just to give you an impression of, of the scale of this and how it's going to change over the next uh, 30 years. When it comes to wind energy, Assuming this, uh, this value of 40 pounds uh, a megawatt hour, um, which I believe is somewhat conservative, the, the main re the message I want to give here is that wind energy is going to be multiplying by about eight times in the next 30 years. This is going to require widespread installation of wind turbines, obviously offshore. It's going to need uh, understanding of the substrate that these are going on to. It's going to need a lot of geotechnical and, and, and geological and geoscientific abilities and skills to get this stuff to work and put it in the right places. Um, the next one in, in, on, the, on the third uh, drop down here is hydrogen. Um, hydrogen production is going to become a very important part of the clean energy agenda in the next 30 years. Hydrogen is going to be initially coming uh, from uh, breaking down uh, methane. Methane comes from the subsurface, from our reservoirs, and geoscientists are going to be needed to really understand that. We also know that we have gaps in the supply of, of, uh, of, uh, of gas uh, going forward as well. So that's covered in, in, in the oil and gas bubble. And you can see how today this, this area is, is so small we can't even put a number into it. And the same actually for carbon capture and storage. And this goes hand in hand with producing hydrogen for energy. We have to dispose of the CO2 that generates as well as providing the capability to dispose of CO2 from industrial processes uh, and energy provision and so on. So we've talked about it yesterday. Uh, I think that 
Um, this space is, is a very, very big space for, 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 the, uh, for the geoscientists of today and tomorrow. I think understanding the risk of, these, uh, of storing CO2, fully understanding that, fully assessing it, and fully representing what are the opportunities for storing CO2 in the subsurface, um, it, it, sits on our, it sits in our laps. Um, I also think um, that there's a lot of knowledge uh, from, the, from, from the oil and gas business. We've got so many wells already in the North Sea. We've got production data, we've got reservoir data, we've got, you name it, we've got so much data and much of it is available digitally and that's going to increase uh, as the years go on. So let's use this capability. There's a big arena for geoscientists of the future to play in, 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 in all four sectors of, of, of the energy in the future. So, um, I showed this slide before in, a, in another conference on seismic, and uh, this, this is a, a picture of uh, Ola Jörn Askin, who, uh, sorry, this is not, that's Carl Johnny Hersvik, who is the CEO for AKBP. AKBP are not alone in uh, digitalizing their business, um, but I think that the voice of AKBP is coming out strongly here um, in, 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 our, in our industry um, because they are really proponents of um, unlocking the data. So they have these t-shirts with the data liberation front written on them, which I quite like. Um, they want to support scalable, reliable, global public cloud infrastructure. They want to, they're against all attempts of locking data into applications. It's no good to, to the rest of the industry if it's sitting in your, uh, in your Petrel projects, et cetera. Um, and they're also, they also want to create a platform that can access all data suitable for machine learning, artificial intelligence, and autonomous operations. So I'm going to leave you with that thought. Um, I think it's a message that's come through everybody's uh, talks this morning, and uh, I'm very much uh, a proponent of it. Thank you very much. <laughs>